just help me pray a moment. This song really echoes the heart of this ministry. We want to see God glorified in everything that we do. All of our lives, every aspect, every part, without exception, we want to glorify God. Because when all is said and done, that's all that's going to matter. Is how much we've invested in the kingdom of God, how much we've loved Him, how much we've obeyed Him, how much we've done what He said. That's it. So Father God, in, in the name of Jesus, You are the Creator, God, above all other gods, above all other lords, above all other kings. You are above. You are greater. You are sovereign. And we honour You in this place. We declare that Jesus Christ is the Lord of our lives and the Lord of this church and the Lord of all the earth. And we thank you that you came and that you died and that you rose again from the dead, never to die again so that we could be saved. We thank you that you're coming back. And then Holy Spirit, we welcome you. We welcome you in this place. Open our hearts today, open our minds today. Connect us to eternity. Make your truth, the truth of the Word of God, real in our lives. Set us free from the giants that oppose us in the land. And we thank you that you are good and your mercy endures forever. Blessed be the name of the Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. You can take your seats this morning. It's, uh, it's great to be here once again. We were here Friday night. Um, Friday night, we had an all-night prayer meeting. And let me tell you, there was probably more people there Friday night than there is here this morning in this first service. It was packed. I mean, if you know, it was packed. It was like a Sunday service, man. And uh, the atmosphere was electric, and God was moving. And, uh, you know, there was, there was such a flow that I didn't see anyone fall asleep, apart from some of the kids. Amen. Um, some of you, maybe you've perfected sleeping standing up. Some of you, maybe, I, I think I saw a few people like that. I thought they were praying like they was at the, the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem, but maybe you were just, you were just dreaming, just twitching and chasing rabbits. But we had a tremendous, tremendous time. It was so fantastic. And we'd ended a 21-day prayer and fasting that we come into this month. And, uh, and so I know that on Saturday, some of you went away and slept like teenagers. You know when people say, I want to sleep like a baby? I don't want to sleep like a baby. They wake up six times a night crying. <laughs> Are you with me? How did you sleep last night like a baby? I'm like, oh, poor thing. <laughs> but if someone said to me, I slept like a teenager, I'm like, yeah, <laughs> get in there. That means hours and hours and hours and hours. Amen. And then I'm sure some of you, not only you got a little bit of sleep Saturday, but some of you, you were breaking your fast. And that's why some of you are twitching right now, because you've started back on sugary drinks. And, you know, there's some people that have got a meat hangover. Come on now. I know that you was on a Daniel fast, and now you're eating chicken again. Hello. Come on now. But it was tremendous. And uh, we had a great time. We pressed in. We broke through. And I mean, if you know, this year's going to be good. And then at the end of it, we got down. Uh, even I was up here throwing some shapes. Uh, we had some serious shoulder action going on, which some kind person filmed and put on social media. Thank you. Me getting down with some shoulder action. Come on now. Thank you for that. That's there forever. Unless I can speak to one of my Russian hacker friends. And even though in Victory Outreach, we got everyone. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Huh? So here we are again. Last week, we spoke about the giants of poverty and materialism because they're two giants that face us and they're twins. We call them the terrible twins because even though they, they might look different, they actually come together and they have the same desired result, which is to keep people's focus away from God, from the power of God, from the blessing of God, from investing in God. 
And so I believe that God is doing some stuff amongst us because even though Victory Outreach is an inner city church, we reach out to people traditionally that are hurting. I mean, if you know, that can encompass not just the drug addicts as, as, as some people think we are as a drug addict ministry, but that encompasses everyone that is far from God. Everyone that has had some sort of situation in their life, no matter what strata of society they're on, doesn't matter what economic background, ethnic background, age background, come on now. We have all different people that come into this ministry and we believe that these giants that we've been facing in this series are trying to stop each and every one of us from fulfilling the plan of God for our lives. And we are we're really focused at the moment and dedicated, I think, to pulling down some of these giants. Because I don't know about you, but I want my future to look so much more prosperous and blessed and healthy and fulfilled than my past. Can someone say amen? amen? Because it doesn't matter how good your past has been, God always makes things better. And so, you know, we've heard a lot about money today and uh, get ready because you're going to hear more. So I'm going to talk today about killing the giant of financial confusion. Woo-hoo. You normally only get that result when you actually say, open to the book of Revelation. <laughs> Whenever you do that in church, come on, let's open to the book of Revelation. Everyone goes, ooh. But we're going to talk about finances today. And then we're not going to talk about it for a while because I pray that over these last, last week and this week, there's going to be some killing of giants that take place that get us out of confusion and out from under the bondage of money. Some of you know, money should not control us. We should control it. And we use money. But when money uses us, then all of a sudden there's a problem. So we're going to look it in the eye, that big old giant. I mean, if you know, sometimes you have to look it in the eye like that because it's big. But we don't run from these things. We face them down. And by the grace of God, in the power of God, with the word of God, backed up by the spirit of God, amen, then we deal with them. So turn around to your neighbor and say, get ready to deal with some stuff. So this is, there's great confusion about money in Christianity. Um, especially in recent years. And I, I, I think it's partly due to the rise of the internet. You know, I'm 50 years old, so when I was growing up, we didn't have the internet. You know, it, it, we didn't have that stuff. I remember, you know, when the internet really started getting, it, getting on it, you know, it, it started becoming big. We didn't have smartphones. We had stupid phones. Come on now. We, we you know, personal computers and all the rest of it. They were slow. You know, we, we, we didn't have all that stuff. And we would have to go to people that had, had, that had actual learning to get information. I mean, if you know, you can go to someone on the internet now who hasn't had any learning. That just has an opinion. And a little bit of sketchy stuff that they've cut and pasted from somewhere else to find information. And the rise of the internet influences people's thinking. You have to understand that. All this information influences people's thinking and it gives the opportunity to pretty much anyone today to give an opinion and give a comment on something and normally from the safety of anonymity and how many of you know there's there's people that have this avatar of some beautiful thing or of some you know tough dude or and if you were to see him in real life you'd laugh right I read some people's Facebook profiles and I know them in person (laughs) and I laugh because you make it sound like on Snapchat and Instagram that you are the Don. (laughs) Come on now. You have a six pack, you run five miles, you eat healthy food, you wear designer clothes. I know (laughs) that you're a scrub. Come on now. You, You ain't even got a driving license. So we have the internet, we have all of this stuff and people fire all these arrows, especially at Christianity, especially at churches, especially at ministers. And um, it's true, and we have to say it, it is true that there has been abuse of finances in, in, in Christianity. There has been the rise of what they call the prosperity gospel 
And I don't think it possibly may have started off in the way that it went on, but I know that it was latched onto by some unscrupulous people. And they became rich uh, uh, whilst their congregations were poor. Or they became rich while people that went to their conferences became poor. You know, they were poor, giving them. And I've been to some stuff where some people have got up and have said, you have to give a thousand and sixty pound right now. And, and then they wait while people run up there and they wait while they get their credit card details before they'll even pray for them. It's heavy stuff. I was there with, it's great to see Pastor Roger and Pastor Leslie, prophetess, hallelujah, of, of art and literature. Amen. We was at a conference once and that's, that very thing happened. And they had placed us up on the platform in a, you know, a position of prominence as leading ministers in the city. And when, when things started happening, we slipped off the platform and we weren't going to be seen up on that platform no more. And I know that there's been abuse. But how many of you know that it's only a tiny amount of unscrupulous people? The Bible actually speaks of some people like this as spots in your love feasts, blemishes in your love feasts, in your, your, your congregations, in your, your reality as the church of Jesus Christ. There's going to be that. So how many of you know there's light and there's dark, Right? We live in the world, but we're not of the world. But in the world, there is greed. There is unscrupulous people. It happens. It happens that not everyone in church is saved. Not everyone's holy. Hello. It happens. But probably 95% plus of all ministers I know have the same financial challenges as everyone else. In fact, probably more. Because our, 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 our income's give, uh, governed by you and your giving. Are you with me? More often than not. And it's capped by our churches. And so we have the same struggles as everyone else. We get blessed, but that's stewarding. I told you yeah, last week, I was wearing a silk Hugo Boss tie and it was nice and I really liked it. And they're what, 70 quid or something if you go to Boss and buy one. I got mine for a fiver on eBay. That's stewardship. <laughs> Amen? That's stewardship. I could have gone to, you know, George Asda and bought one for a fiver. But I've got a Silk Hugo Boss made by elves. <laughs> Rather than a polyester one made by people in another nation. Amen? Right? So, there's stewardship. But the challenges of finances are the same for all of us. Amen? But we need to deal with some of this confusion because I think that once you can deal with spiritual confusion over finances, it's going to set you free. So let's look it in the eye together and let's deal with it, shall we? Yeah. Amen? Or the alternative is we can just not look at it and just hope that it goes away. How many of you know, anyone ever, of you have ever dealt with a bully? Come on now. I'm a big lump, big scary dude, man, right? Big dangerous dude back in the day. I got bullied when I was at school, once. <laughs> the thing is with bullies, they don't leave you alone if you deny that they're, that, they're, that, they're, that they're there. You have to get in their face and you have to deal with them and you have to let them know that I ain't a victim. Are you with me? I'm a victor. So you come near me, and you might get away with it once, but next time I'm going to smash you to pieces. Praise the Lord. You'll be picking your broken teeth up with broken fingers off the floor. Come on now. Right? And that's how we need to deal with things in the Word of God and in our Christian experience is that there are things that we don't understand, things we don't want to look at, but they will not go away on their own. This giant of financial confusion will not just leave. It will continue to confuse you unless you deal with it. So we're going to go in and we're going to deal with it. Because while the confusion is there, this giant is diverting the resource of money away from where it can do so much good, investing into eternal things and especially into God's idea, which is the church. And you can tell when this giant is working because when, as soon as you hear the words giving money and church, all of a sudden, you start getting all suspicious, right? And you flip to this little negative mentality. Well, where's it going? Well, what's he driving? What's he wearing? 
Where have they been? What's the church got? What, what? Ooh, hallelujah. I got you, huh? Some of you are there right now. Right now, you're like, what is he talking about money? Greedy. <laughs> Greedy Christians. You know, where's love and peace and the poor? Standing here mostly. Huh? This confusion takes three forms that I've recognized. So there are at least three questions that we want to ask, and I'm going to try and get through them as quick as I can, as comprehensively as I can. The first question is, as a follower of Jesus, should I give money? Should I give money? Because, you know, you get saved, and it's not the first thing on your mind, is it? And then you come to church, and then it's like, well, should I give money? Should I even give money? Are you with me? The second question is, if, if, if you answer that, where should I give? As a Christian, where should I give? Right? Have you ever asked that question, where should I give? A lot of people don't know where to give. And the third thing, is there an amount I should give? If you start answering these questions, then there's this, it gets back to this amount that you should give. And the giant of spiritual confusion causes these problems about money because while some people get born again and immediately begin to seek what to do and how to live as citizens of the kingdom of God, others are born again and then it takes a lot longer for them to adjust into their new way of living. Some, when I got saved, my first thing on my mind was not what should I give, right? Because I was a taker. I, I, I was a robber. I was a taker. Are you with me? So when I got saved, I was a junkie. I just wanted to get free. But then when Jesus set me free, I'm like, I'm in this. This is real, baby. What do I need to do now? What do I need to do to be a part of what God wants me to do? Stupid phone. <laughs> it's meant to be smart. Huh? But other people, it takes them a little bit longer to adjust. And so some people... It's caught. For other people, it needs to be taught. Amen? And you can be in, in either one of those two camps. It doesn't really matter. What matters is that you understand what God wants to see so that this giant is no longer bullying you. Praise the Lord. For example, in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 through 9, we read about giving. We read about Paul. He's speaking, the apostle Paul speaking to the church in Corinth about offerings and giving and all the rest of it. And we read and we see that the Macedonian believers, Paul's speaking about the Macedonian believers. What's going on here? Oh, yeah, all right, thank you. Someone's sending me a text. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Huh? The Macedonian believers that Paul is speaking about, he uses them in contrast to the Corinthians. The Macedonians, he said, they were in poverty. They were impoverished, but they were generous. They just had it. They caught it. But the Corinthians needed to be taught it. Even though they had spiritual gifts, they had prophets and preachers and gifts of tongues and things breaking out all over the place, he still had to teach them to complete all of that stuff with the act of giving. Are you with me? So you see that, that there are two different things here and uh, there was confusion that could happen. And when this financial confusion is fully operational, it causes a major thing to take place. It blocks God's blessing. This is the key. It blocks the blessing of God, both for the individual who should be given, but also for the majority of people that will benefit from that giving. So in it, however you look at it, there's a blockage that takes place upon the blessing of God. And the giant is standing there, and all these giants, what they want to do is they want to stop access to the grace of God and to the blessing of salvation. We saw that on Friday night. Huh? So let's take a look at what this, this church believes about giving. And I believe this church is in... Is in is in harmony with the church of Jesus Christ about giving. And so we need to understand that we're not weird, funky out there. We are down the line, orthodox in our New Testament belief about giving. And we're going to do our best to answer these three questions. Firstly, number one, as a follower of Jesus, should I give money? Firstly, we have to begin with the idea of a steward. A steward. This word carries the idea that you've been given something to look after that's not yours. But you can enjoy the benefits of it, right? 
It's like if someone gives you the keys to their house while they're on holiday and they've got a full fridge, nice central heating, 60 inch 4K curved screen TV with Sky, Netflix and everything and you've just come from a bed set, right? The house don't belong to you but you have been given the keys to look after the house but while you're in the house, you can enjoy the benefits of the house. Woo, hallelujah. That's stewardship, right? As long as you use it the way the owner wants you to. If all of a sudden you got the keys and you had all your mates around to have some mad party, right? And they scribbled pictures on the walls and they broke the furniture and all the rest of it and they ended up walking out with the telly, <laughs> like some of you have done in your past. You've had house parties like that, right? Your parents have had to pay the bill. Come on now. Someone else's parents have had to pay the bill. Huh? As long as you're doing it the, right, the way that, that the owner wants it to, you're being a good steward. In Matthew 25, verses 14 through 30, we find the parable of the three servants. It begins like this, verse 14. It says, again, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a man going on a long trip. He called together his servants. He entrusted his money to them while he was gone. In other translations, it uses the word talents, but all that means is that in those days, it was just a measurement of money. It can either be used as a measurement of money or a measurement of responsibility, but it uses this word. We're, look, we're looking at money right now. Then the servants went about using what had been given to them, and the story continues in verse 19. It says, after a long time, their master returned from his trip and called them to give an account of how they had used his money. The three servants, then they, 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 you see that in the story, they've begun stewarding or managing the master's money. And to the one who had done well, he said in verse 21, he said, well done, good and faithful servant. We, we always associate that with going to heaven after, after we've lived and we die, we turn our toes up, we go and meet with the Lord at the judgment seat of Christ or whatever. And the Lord looks at everything we've done and if we've done good, he says, well done, good and faithful servant, right? And you have Christians preaching messages about it. Oh, I'd long to hear those words, you know, and all that. But here he's using it about what we actually do with what he's given us in this life. Amen. He said, you have been faithful in handling this small amount. So now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. So it's good, there's benefits for using these things right. Every Christian longs to hear these words. So money and giving are gospel issues. They don't cause you to be saved. They don't keep you saved. But there's a quality of your salvation that can be, be seen and the quality of your faith that can be seen by how you handle the old moolah. Huh? They're important. These issues are important. Here's some important facts about the subject of money. I'm not going to go right into it for the sake of time. But how many of you know that Jesus talked about money more than he talked about heaven and hell? Because heaven and hell are these things that are going to happen in the future. But how many of you know that money is something that you need to utilize right now? Jesus talked about money more than anything else except the kingdom of God. 11 of his 39 parables talk about money. In fact, if you account about finances and giving and stuff, there's actually more of the parables that actually focus on this subject. One in every seven verses in the Gospel of Luke talks about money, giving, or finance. That's heavy. Are you with me? And we skip over this stuff, don't we? But this stuff plays a massive part in our Christian lives. The word money is actually used in connection with Jesus, whether he uses the word or, or uses it in connection with him 25 times through the four Gospel accounts of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So all of these stories... Uh, there's multiple stories, multiple illustrations that Jesus uses about money. Jesus didn't talk about money because he was obsessed with money or that he wanted us to have lots of it or that he wanted us to stay poor or whatever. But he did it because he knew that money is a heart issue. Are you with me? Your money, what you do with your money shows where your heart is at. Who do you serve? Because you cannot serve God and mammon. Money, materialism, right? You'll hate the one and love the other, etc., etc., etc. So he knows that money, finance, possessions, accumulation is about the heart. And that's why he zeroed in on it so many times. 
because money is one of the most likely reasons for someone to not follow him in the first place or to give up on him somewhere in their walk because of money. Are you with me? The amount of people that money has got in the way of their relationship with the Lord, their relationship with church, their relationship with, with their spouse, with a friend, etc. So what you do with money is key. Do you hold it all to yourself or do you invest it in the way the master wants you to? This is important. Now, there are three types of giver. We've looked at the steward, but there's three types of giver that I've, I've noticed. The first type is the carnal giver, what we call the carnal giver. The word carnal comes from the word carne. It means meat. I remember Pastor Sonny, when I was with Pastor Sonny, he's uh, the founder of Victory Outreach. He used to interpret for Nicky Cruz on crusades in the early days. He said he would be his interpreter because Nicky, if you know him, he still has a very strong Spanish accent. I was, just, I was just with him at his 80th birthday party, man. He's still going strong. And uh, he still, still can't understand three, three of, you know, after words he speaks about. So Pastor Sonny used to interpret it for him. And one day he's interpreting this great big stadium. And Nicky was talking about, God takes your heart of flesh, the heart of stone, and turns it into heart of flesh. Right? And in Spanish, it's the word carne, carne. Right? And so Pastor Sonny's just interpreting, and he was going, Yeah, and God takes your heart of stone and turns it into a heart of meat. And Nicky looked at him and, No, Sonny, flesh, flesh. It's just a little story for you, because you was getting all serious talking about carnal givers. The carnal giver has a give to get mentality. Giving becomes an act of self-righteousness, like that of the Old Testament Pharisees. You see it when they wave their thing in the air. I've been to services where everyone's competing to how much they can throw down, and I make sure everyone knows. I went to a thing once, I was preaching at a conference, and this guy got up before we'd even got into it, and they were taking an offering. He said, God's told me that we need to bless the man of God. And I thought, lovely. And then he pointed at someone else. <laughs> right? There was a thousand ministers in the place. And they all came and gave an offering to the man of God. And they, in the end, they were competing to put down their money. They put it on the platform. It was heavy. Are you with me? And they put, there was this big pile. And they were all coming up. Some of them were coming up all secret. They probably weren't giving a lot. You know what I mean? But some of them were coming and they were like, Old Testament Pharisees, look at me how much I'm giving. That's no good. That don't get you nowhere. Carnal giving. Huh? Giving to be seen. And only when it benefits them. That's a carnal giver. Then you've got the casual giver. Number two, the casual giver. The casual giver only gives when they feel like it. You know, when you've got, you flush. Come on now, you've got a little bit of money. You can, you, can, you can do it, you know. I feel like giving today. I like that message. I've got a few quid. I feel like giving today. But their giving has nothing to do with faith or obedience to God, or sacrifice for the causes of God. And then this giver sometimes forgets to give. Or they make excuses. Or they sign a little IOU and put it in a bucket. God, I'm not going to give to you this week because I'm, I'm going out for something to eat. But next week, or next month, I'll pay you back. And I know you've done that. Hello. This is casual giving. Huh? And they make excuses as to why God and God's work doesn't receive anything from them. Well, I ain't got enough, I don't agree, I don't this, I don't understand. And this type of giving mentality, mentality describes the tippers. I call them the tippers. When the basket goes round, they fling in a tip. Come on now. Not a tithe, a tip. They give them a little bit, a bit of shrapnel in their pocket. How much have I got in my pocket? Oh, you know. And we, I call it a, a jingle offering. I prefer the silent offerings. You know the ones where the paper whispers in the basket? I even wanted to have our giving baskets made of metal. So when they went round, you could hear them jingling. Ching, 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 ching. But my, my, my spirit said no. The third one is the covenant giver. These people are consistent, faithful, generous, cheerful, and usually spiritual. They give intentionally, they give regularly. And more often than not, they give sacrificially, above and beyond what is safe or what is comfortable for them. 
This type of giver has decided the amount that they will give to God and they stick with it through thick and thin. Huh? Many start by giving out 10% of their income. We're going to look at that in a minute. And then they grow into giving much more. Covenant givers honor God. They honor his church. They honor the work of the kingdom of God. And they bless. And then they find themselves being blessed by God. The blessing of God flows into their life. And then it flows through their life. And they find it. You can't even sometimes explain the blessing of God. But because you're a covenant giver, you step into another area with God where you just get blessed. Amen? It's not always easy. There's always that demon that attacks Christians' finances that stands against you. You know what his name is? Bill. Amen? That is the demonic name of the spirit that attacks Christians' finances. His name is Bill. Gas bill, phone bill, tax bill. Hello. Right? Even though Bill is around, you still know that Bill is going down. You'll pay the bill. Amen? Praise God. The truth is, your giving doesn't necessarily make you spiritual, but it definitely shows if you are. I know which one works for me. I learned when I first got saved and I went into the men's home and I started to give out of my, my gyro. Back then we had the gyro. I mean, if you remember the gyro. Huh? Well, I refused to worship Jehovah Gyro. <laughs> Amen. Some people would get their little gyro and they'd keep it all to themselves, all 47 pounds worth of it. Ooh. But I learned that if I, if I paid a tithe and I, made, I paid an offering, funny enough, my money would stretch further than their money. That people would buy me tickets to go to America, to conferences. That someone would come in and buy me a new tracksuit or me a new pair of trainers. Come on now. God was blessing me. Whereas all the other dudes was wearing stuff out of the bless me box. You know, where people, people come into our homes and they give clothes. Don't do it. Because you give horrible clothes. You give clothes you would never wear. Amen. Not even clothes you've grown out of. Some of you need to go into your wardrobe. You need to get all those fantasy clothes that you have. I mean, if you know, everyone's got fantasy clothes in their wardrobe. You know the ones that you're going to get back into one day? You know the ones with the waist size that you used to have when you was on drugs? Come on now. Right? Before you got married. <laughs> huh? As soon as you get married, it's all over, huh? As soon as you get married, you're done. You put on a stone in weight. As soon as you get married... Men, men definitely do. Women put on more because they, you ever seen, listen. You ever seen yes to the dress? Who's ever seen yes to the dress? Say yes to the dress. They're always there buying their dress two sizes too small. Going on mad wedding diets so they can look good going down the aisle. What happens after the honeymoon? Anyway, anyway. I learned that you can never outgive God. Can someone say amen? amen? And therefore, we can see that giving is an essential part of a born again believer's journey of growth and obedience. And it is eventually rewarded. So, if we can get that down, that Christians need to give, right? It's in the Bible. We need to give. The second question is where should I give? Where should I give? And this is a legitimate question. Jesus said in, in, in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, he says, I will build my church, right? And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The forces of darkness will not overcome it. Whatever it is, however you read that. But church is his idea. But watch this. Jesus came and he founded the church. The church was born on the day of Pentecost and we've been in the church age for 2,000 years. Amen. Amen. This is between the 69th and the 70th week of Daniel's prophecy. 2,000 years of the church age. There's going to come a time when the, the, the amount of the Gentiles has come in and then boom, goes back and everything starts going crazy. 
But we're in the age of grace, we're in the age of the church, we're in a place right now where we can be saved and come to church and gather together and we can do this. We can't do it everywhere in the world, but we can do it in Manchester, we can do it in Liverpool, we can do it in London, we can do it in Birmingham, we can do it in Scotland, we can do it in Europe. Amen? Come on now. And so we have to understand that Jesus wants his church to develop so that the world can know the gospel. And he's the head of the church. And his plan of salvation is worked out in and through the church. And in the same way, Jesus' people are to give themselves first to the church. You read this in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and chapter 9. And, uh, and, and then this giving yourself to the church includes service. It includes your time and your talent. But it also includes your treasure, your generosity. And Jesus demonstrated it throughout the Word of God, and Paul spoke about it in 2 Corinthians. So that not only can the local churches grow, but more and more churches can be planted. More people can be reached. More nations changed by the power of the gospel. And in this church, Victory Outreach Manchester, we're focused on creating an environment where people can get together to worship God and learn about Jesus and His plan for their life. And we do everything to do that the lights, the worship, the bells and whistles, even the toilets and the way that we signpost them is to give you ease of access so nothing can get in the way of you worshipping Jesus Christ. But that takes money, it takes servanthood, it takes volunteers. Are you with me? We're a transformational church here. We believe in transformation. How many of you, your lives have been transformed by the power of God in one way, shape or form? We don't just want pew warmers, although if you are a pew warmer, come and warm the pew that we haven't got because we have chairs. <laughs> and they're covered in fabric, so they're not cold, amen. But you can come and sit and get to know things. You don't have to jump straight in and be a lunatic like us, straight away, amen. You can grow into becoming a lunatic. Huh? It's all right, praise the Lord. But we're a transformational church, and we believe in making disciples. We don't just believe in converts just coming and, and ticking a little box on a Sunday and then going away and living how they want for the rest of the week. We want to teach you. We want to train you. We want to equip you. We want to let you know that this is what we believe. This is how the Word of God is. We want to break down the Scriptures. We, 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 we're going to call you out on sin. And it's not because it makes us feel better, but, but, but because when you obey the Word of God, it's going to make you better. Yeah, Amen. But we ain't going to judge you. Just come. Keep coming, man. We have people that keep coming in, keep messing up, keep coming back. We love you anyway. Praise the Lord. But we want to see the best for you. Amen. We have Christian recovery homes for men and women so they can get set free from drugs. This makes us quite unique as a church because not only is it one church doing it, and there's individual churches that do it around the world, but this is a movement of churches in 40 countries that does it consistently all around the world. And wherever you go in this ministry or movement, you will find, I was just at a conference in the States with thousands and thousands and thousands of ex-drug addicts. And we have that consistently. Huh? We've seen people saved on a regular basis. We see drug addicts saved, alcoholics set free and serving Jesus. But more than that, we see families reconciled. We see normal people. <laughs> ah, normal people. How many of you think you're normal? As soon as you put your hand up, you're not. <laughs> Amen. I tried to be normal once. Two minutes, worst two minutes of my life. Ain't no one normal. Amen. But even normal people with good jobs and all that, they have a purpose, they have a destiny, they find dignity. It's a powerful, powerful thing. But it's the church. And a lot of things we've done couldn't have been accomplished without Jesus working through generous people who love his mission and the vision of this church. But let's have some statistics about charitable giving. Where, where should we give? Let's have a look at it, right? The British are quite charitable, aren't they? You know, we have live aid. Do you remember live aid? You have, you know, this aid, that aid. You know, pictures on their TV screen of a little African kid with a vulture over him. When are we going to get the pictures of a little kid from Salford living in poverty with a vulture over him, right? It's all relevant. It's all there. But people are charitable in giving to those in need, where there's need, right? British are charitable. What about when they have the big teddy? What's his name with a patch? Pugsy. 
You know, and they do this aid, don't they? Sport aid, they do this aid, they do that aid. And they're always saying, oh, we're up to 1.7 million. We're up to 5 million. We're up to 3 million. And people are sitting there in the luxury of their front room sending money in. We're very charitable as a nation. And giving to charities and organisations is a great thing. According to statistics, 55% of the UK population gives regularly to charity. That's heavy. 55%. That's really good. The largest proportion of that 42% 42% give £6 a month. All of a sudden, it don't look so good. £6 a month? <laughs> and you feel good. That's okay. £6 a month. You're on two grand a month. Three grand a month. And you're giving £6 a month? And then like, yeah, I'll give it to charity. <laughs> you give more than that in a tip on the meal that you had. Hello. The biggest givers that give £150 more or more a month amount to 7% of the population. 7% of the population. This is all the population, including churches. Medical causes rank highest in charitable donations. Fantastic. Cancer, awareness, you know, all that stuff. Blah, blah, Red Cross, all that stuff. Fantastic. 33% of those people give to the medical charities. 14% of people encompass religious giving. 14%. Incredibly and sadly, religious giving at 14% is beaten by those giving to animal causes, 16%. And that's okay if dogs really do go to heaven. But people go to heaven, but people would rather give to a charity for dogs or abused donkeys than drug abusers. But we believe And I believe the Bible sets out very clearly that Christians are called first to give to their local church that they are a part of that proclaims the gospel in the local community. Before you give, you can give to the dog's charity. Make sure you give to church. Are you with me? You can pay six pound a month to live aid or gift aid or sport aid. That's fine. But make sure you give a bigger percentage of your income to church. Are you catching this? Right? And some people are like, well, statistics. That, statistics, man. These are statistics that you can read about. So God's people, how is their giving? Generally, it's, it's a little bit better than unbelievers, but it's still not enough. Some even come to church regularly, but give their money elsewhere and then think they're still doing God's will. Well, I come to, I've heard it. I had, a, I had a conversation with a guy and I asked him, he wanted to be in leadership in our church. If you come to church, you do what you like, man. Come, we love you, praise the Lord. You want to be in representational leadership, I'm going to get in your business a little bit more because you're representing. I said to him, all right. He said, I want to get involved, I want to do this. I said, all right, how's your giving? Well, I, I give. Well, I, okay, I'm going to check your records. Is that all right? Well, I ain't got no records. You won't find none. Why? Because I do my giving in different ways. You know, when, when I, I, I take someone out for a meal, I'll pay for their meal when I'm discipling them. Or, you know, I'll, I'll sometimes give someone a bit of petrol money to get to church. Well, that's nice. But you ain't going to be a leader in this church because that's not helping this church. You're not being part of the solution. Are you with me? Can I speak to you like this? Can I be very open and honest? He had a concept that he was giving a little percentage of his money to someone else in nice ways, right? Which is fine. But yet he then wanted to be a leader in this church and even get expenses and maybe get a little wage. (laughs) Far too many people don't give or they tip God a bit of shrapnel from their leftovers But if every believer made a covenant to invest in their local church, it would enable the church to do so much more. Amen? But people are saying, isn't there the possibility of abusing money? Of course there is. Humans are humans, man. 
Some people can abuse the money, right? You see me coming to church in my helicopter, ask a question. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Next time I come, I've got, I've got teeth like the donkey out of Shrek. <laughs> ask where I got that eight grand to get me teeth done. Hello. Other than that, Look at me smiling with my little yellow teeth and coming in my little car that's four or five years old and, and, and understand that maybe that we don't do that. But we also have very strong checks and balances. Amen. We employ a qualified accountant. And he's qualified. He has to get a license every year. He can't fumble the money. He'd be struck off. He wouldn't have a job, right? We have no one deal with our finances alone. There's always an accountability structure. No one even counts it on their own when you make a, a, an offering. There's other people. There's people that do it. And we have a board of trustees that are legally responsible to oversee all of our incomes and outcomes and make sure that we're not mangling the money or we're taking liberties with it. All of these things are in place. Amen. So that makes this healthy ground. This is healthy soil. It's well accounted for. Amen. The money goes out well. Amen. You have to understand that. We have our accounts on the Charity Commission. We, we, you, can, you, know, you can ask the questions, it's all there. We have annual general meetings where we bounce out all of the figures. You even had a manual coming up here and giving you some figures, right? It's good soil, man. So, number three. Is there an amount I should give? This is where the biggest confusion comes, right? Especially in today's church. Is there an amount I should give? I want you to understand this, first of all. In contrast to the old covenant law of tithing, the New Testament never ever gives us a required amount that we must contribute. In the Old Testament, it was clear in the law that you must give this. In the New Testament, it's kind of left shady. It's kind of, you know, it's not really spoken of. There's, there's stuff that would have gone on because the church were all Jews, so they would have paid the tithe initially, but then when it hit the Gentiles, what then? Are you with me? It seems that things could change. Second Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6 through 7 says this, the point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each, man, each one must give as he has decided in his own heart, not reluctantly, not under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. That word cheerful is good in Greek. It means hilarious. Someone that goes beyond, like, you're just, just having a little laugh. It's someone that's like, ha, 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 I'm going to give this, ha, ha. <laughs> huh? When's the last time you did that? Most people give, give a whiny giving. <laughs> huh? So from that, we can see that giving, generous, giving generously is, is, is rewarded. But the amount you have to decide in your heart, according to your income as well. So why do we talk about the tithe then? Well, in the New Testament, it don't designate a percentage of income. It's in keeping with your income, right? So you can give whatever you like, pretty much. Some in the Christian church take that 10% figure from the Old Testament church and use it as a floor. But why do they do that? I've got a lot of stuff about the tithe. People say it's 10%. But when you have a look through the Old Testament, the tithe referred to God's people giving the first 10% of their gross income called first fruits. It was always first anyway, right? This is important information. Just get this, and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you the coup de grace. Hallelujah. Huh? The first 10% from your income first belongs to God, not the last or the middle portion. Whatever you decide to give, you take it off the top, right? This was to fund the Levite priest ministry and included the upkeep of the temple. But then in addition to that, there were other tithes and offerings required of God's people. There was 10% for festivals, for community building, for celebration. We see this in Deuteronomy. 3% was, was to be given to the poor. They had to leave their crops 
so that they, they, their poor people could glean them. Food, donations, whatever, right? So in total, there were, and there were other occasional additional offerings every three years and every this and that. But in total, all told, the mandatory Old Testament tithe resulted in between 25 and 35% of your income. Not 10. Amen? People say now, well, 10% is too much of your income. You know, I'm a taxpayer, and blah, blah. Yeah, your 20% adds on to that. If you want to go down that route. And then you're in the same boat as the God's people back in the day. Amen? In our day, some of this 25, 30% corresponds to your tax. It's cool. That goes on society. But then there's still a portion that you need to put in the temple in the, to God's people. Right? So then today's church, we, we use the term tithe a lot. But it's more for convenience than anything else. It, it, it's convenient when talking about the tithe for giving because it focuses people on what it is you're trying to get across. Are you with me? It doesn't necessarily mean that if you earn 101 pounds that you have to give 10 pound 10 pence. Otherwise, you're disobeying God. Some people get all religious about it. Forget that stuff. It's a convenient term. Well, it's time for our tithes now. Everyone knows what it is that we're talking about. It's time for our covenant giving that's part of our worship that comes into our church. Amen? In the New Testament, financial giving focuses in God's people on grace. You're unable to give. When you've got grace, you can give. Generosity. You give generously because you trust in a God that can never be outgiven. Right? And it's not about actual percentages of your income. The word tithe is rarely used in the New Testament. Although Jesus does use it when he's talking about the Pharisees. And watch what he says. Matthew chapter 5 verse 20. He says, I tell you, unless your righteousness... He's talking about in this about tithes. He said, you know, you tithe a tenth of your mint and rue. You do this and do that. But you should have done this. Not that you shouldn't have done that. But that was not just the only thing you should be doing, right? Then he says, I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you'll never enter the kingdom of God. So whatever it was that they were doing under law, we need to be able to be doing at least that, I think, under grace. Because how can we exceed the, the, the righteousness of the Pharisees? Not by law, because they had 613 laws that they would get down. Right? And we don't do that, but we don't have to. But we have grace. And that grace enables us to lift up. Are you catching this or are you switched off already? The scribes and Pharisees were tithers amongst other things. And Jesus said that we should exceed what they did only by the grace of God. In the New Testament, giving is a grace thing. God enables it. Firstly, by giving us the ability to have money. And then secondly, by empowering us generously to release money in the right places in the right way. Huh? And one thing about grace that people sometimes get wrong is that grace is not an excuse to do something that is, is not an excuse not to do something that's required by God. Some people say, I didn't do it because it's grace. Or I'm in sin, but God knows it's grace, isn't it? That, that's not grace, that's mercy. There's a lot of people in churches that are under the mercy of God, but they're not operating in the grace of God. God's, God's covering you for the time being, and you're not getting judged for what you're doing, but you're not being blessed for what you're doing either. Does that make sense? And giving needs to be by grace. Grace is not an excuse not to give. Someone once said, you can either worship money or worship with money, but you can't do both. So the tithe, 10%, then becomes a floor. It becomes a foundation to go beyond the legalistic limits. And it's by the grace of God. I heard this story about proportion, right? Some people get bent out of shape with this. I heard this story, and there was a man who was making 200 pounds a week, right? he came come to church, he'd been blessed, he was making 200 pounds a week. And so he figured, he's decided in his heart that he was going to match the tithe of the Old Testament you know, at least in the 10%. So he figured he's going to give 20 pound. So he give 20 pound, 10% of his 200 pound. And he would give it faithfully and he would give it regularly. 20 pound out of 
200 pounds. He'd have 180 quid to live, to live on. And it was fantastic, right? And he started getting blessed. He started having opportunities for new jobs opening up. He started getting promoted. He started becoming the solution to someone's problem. Whenever you become the solution to someone's problem, you end up getting a promotion. Amen? And he would get promoted. And he went from £200 a week to £500 a week to £1,000 a week to eventually he was in the big dog league and he was earning £2,500 a week. Right? And now all of a sudden he started getting a little bit, little bit digy about his giving. He, was, he wasn't, I'm not comfortable now. I'm giving 10% of £2,500. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of money I'm giving to the church. So he decided to go and get wisdom. And he went to a spiritual wise man and he explained his problem to him. And he said, look, he said, I was earning £200 a week. I was grateful to God. He was giving me £200 a week. I decided that I was going to pay my, my, my covenant giving of 10%, £20 a week crash. He said, that was good, £20 into the church. I'm fulfilling God's will for my life. He said, but then I started getting promoted. I started getting pay rises. I started earning more money. Now I'm earning £2,500 a week and I'm having to give £250 a week to the church. I'm uncomfortable with that. It's a lot of money. He said, what, is, what should I do? And the wise man said, I'll tell you what we should do, if you like. He said, we can pray and we can ask God to decrease your wages down to the, the amount that you're comfortable to give. How would you like that? It's heavy, huh? Because the blessing of God was with him. I know people that live on 50% of their income income and give 50% to the church. We kind of do that, I think. I think we live on about 50% of our income. I know people that live on 10% of their income give 90% to the church. And all right, they're earning a million pound a year, but, you know, 900 grand's a lot to give. Not in this church, by the way. <laughs> Although, praise God, if you, if you are watching this online, <laughs> there is a donate button. In conclusion, should a Christian give? I believe yes. Where should they give? I believe first into God's house. How much should they give? However much God places upon your heart, according to your faith, let it be done unto you. Amen? No one's going to look at you and judge you because you're not giving a certain percentage. We don't look at, I don't look at the, 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 the income. The accountants do that. I don't look at the tithing records. I don't look at your name and see how much you give. I don't even look. Amen? Unless you're a pastor or a leader, you're representing the church and we're paying you, amen, they're not going to look because you're representing, but I don't take care of that, and then they don't look at you and say, oh, they're giving this, that, that, that must mean they must be earning that, oh, they don't do that, it's not about that, but it's about, are you being blessed, are there testimonies that God is blessing you, do you have a testimony of the last time God blessed you, because you gave, and giving does more than just bring you back money. Giving covers you. It covers your family. It covers your life. You get protection from certain things. Are you with me? God protects you because you're a giver. You get all your stuff back. Hallelujah. Tremendous testimonies we hear. Even when you get robbed, you get all the stuff back. Come on now. God is good. And he wants us to be givers, to decide in our hearts what it is we're going to give and then give it to God through thick and through thin, regardless of anything else. And then I tell you what, if the percentage, it's not, we're not even, I'm not even trying to, we have good givers in this church, man, but a small percentage. And sometimes when, we're, when we have a need, we, we, we present the need and the good givers, they come and they give more. They take care of business because they know the principle and they can because they're blessed. But I'm not praying that the good givers 
give more. I'm praying that more people will give. Because if you have been tipping God, start tithing. New Testament fashion, using that as a convenient term. Be a covenant giver. Decide in your heart that this first bit belongs to God. And then if you really want to be blessed, out of a hundred pounds, if you take 10 and give it to God and then put 10 in the bank for a rainy day and then live off 80, you're going to prosper. Amen? Imagine that. Close your eyes. Father, we're asking you at this start of this new season, this new year, we're asking you for breakthrough. God, we're going we're gonna to have that wave of the spirit revival, the goosebumps, spiritual gifts, prophecy, health, healing, breakthrough. We're going to have all that because you are in this church. We have no doubt. Church is more than a building, it's a people. But it's a people that create a community, a culture, and an atmosphere, and an environment for you to come and do all those things. And Lord, I pray this church would be a church that is faithful, that is generous, so that we can have that atmosphere and that environment. Because in this atmosphere, in this environment, family members are going to get saved. People out on the streets are going to get saved. The lost are going to get saved. Those that have been blocked from the blessing of salvation through these giants and their work in society, they are going to get a breakthrough. But Lord God, we can't expect someone else to break down those giants in our lives. We're facing them. And we're declaring right now that even though you're big and scary, and even though you've had us on the run before, you come at us with all your skill and all your power and all your intimidation, but we come at you in the name of the Lord of hosts. Who are you, uncircumcised Philistine? You giant of darkness to stand in the way of the living God and His work in this city, in this nation, in this generation. The Lord rebuke you. Take your hands off of every single heart in this place. Father, release your anointing. Release more grace in people's lives. Right now, decide in your heart what you're going to give from this day forward. Right now, do it. From this day forward. What are you going to give? Where are you going to give? If you're a guest here and you're from another church, go back to your church and be faithful in that church. Amen? But if this is your church, decide what you're going to give to this church from the income that God has given you the ability to receive. And then be faithful. Don't just let it be a one-off thing. Be faithful. Don't, don't, don't tell me you're going to do great things for the Lord and you don't even give. Deceiving yourself. But if you do give, woo, hallelujah. It's going to position you for some stuff. Amen. Let's all stand to our feet. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.